Hi everyone. Um, what I'm going to present here is uh, <coughs> part of a recent project I'm involved in. Uh, so I don't have much data about it, and um, I prepared a theoretical slide for you. So, um, time allowing, I'll speak about the project itself a little. So uh, I'll start with some concepts since this project is about uh, cosmopolitanism and uh, electronic games and teacher education. I'll start with some concepts about cosmopolitanism. So uh, both Apia and uh, Todd mentioned that the concept of cosmopolitanism goes back uh, to 4th fourth, fourth century Greece. Uh, at that time, the citizen was said to belong to a particular polis. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, as contrasted with the idea of cosmos, or the world, or the universe. So being cosmopolitan then, at that time, was a rejection of the conventional view that every civilized person belonged to a community among communities. And then Jenkins also remembers that the first cosmopolitans thought beyond the borders of their villages. And uh, the modern cosmopolitans think globally. And then this is the idea that I'm going to um, work on in this presentation. Uh, Cheryl Todd also said that um, we cannot be so narrow in our sights that we only see ourselves in relation to our, our nearest and dearest. And then she mentions that with globalization, mixture of populations and uh, technological advances, our neighbors, um, we make up neighbors out of the most distant of inhabitants. So for her, cosmopolitanism uh, should involve a political and ethical intervention into already existing ways of life. Apia also says that we have obligations to others and not only to our nearest and dearest. And we should also learn from our differences. And for Fazal Rizvi, our world is in the interdependent globally and most of our problems are global in nature, requiring then global solutions. So from there I'll jump to um, some concepts uh, related to the idea of the popular. I'll start with uh, Gramsci and uh, his concept of the national popular. For him, I'll, I'll talk about this very briefly. Uh, he was, when he mentioned national popular, he was referring to mainly uh, homemade popular cultural items for um, a national audience. So uh, uh, towards uh, an internal market within the national boundaries. And then we have the idea of the international popular by the Brazilian sociologist Renato, Renato Ortiz, uh, who expanded this idea uh, to homemade popular cultural items for the international market. So um, for international consumption. And he, ref he uh, mentions the, the case of Brazilian soap operas, when then, uh, up to today, it's when it is produced, it's not only having Brazilian audience uh, in mind, but also towards the international market. When I was in Cuba in 2000, uh, Brazilian soap operas were very popular there, and uh, was like, uh, uh, in Basically, every, everywhere you, you would go, you would see um, this Brazilian soap opera uh, on TV. Uh, and that seems to go on, go, uh, go on and up to, to, up to today. Then we have the idea of transnational popular for UC, uh, who said that national culture can only be defined by its interaction with transnational cultural reference. So we cannot think of it in uh, just uh, uh, as something related to to the, the national boundaries only. 
And the uh, concept that I'm using here that comes from Jenkins, pop cosmopolitanism, as he describes it, the ways that the transcultural flows of popular culture inspire new forms of global consciousness and cultural competence. Uh, it refers mainly to uh, young Americans uh, and how they try to distinguish from themselves from their parents by using consuming Japanese anime, manga, Bollywood films, and uh, Hong Kong action movies, uh, mainly Asian cultural items. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, not necessarily about these kind of um, uh, cultural items, but uh, maybe doing the, re the, the the reverse, thinking of how we Brazilians. Um, relate to these items made mostly in uh, North America. Uh, so, another aspect is, um, Jenkins mentions these ideas of, of transcultural flows. So I brought this from Pennycook as well. He finds it as the way in which cultural forms move, change, and are reused to fashion new identities in diverse contexts what um, presupposes appropriation, change, and refresh, refreshing. Uh, he's also interested in seeing how users select, appropriate, refreshing, and return new cultural and linguistic forms through complex interactive cultural groups. And uh, within these groups, he mentions um, also, he, he um, states that there are some subcultural affiliations mainly in terms of gender, class, sexual orientation, profession, interests, and desires. When you talk about interests and desires, we can think of uh, G's uh, affinity spaces as well. Uh, he has, I think, some different ideas uh, from Pennycook, because uh, according to him, social activists, for example, whatever the causes are, organize themselves in terms of affinity spaces, where people who may share little and even differ dramatically on other issues affiliate around their common cause and the practices associated with espousing it. One of the characteristics of such spaces is that common endeavor, not race, class, gender, or disability is primary. Um, what happens then for him is that what he calls cross-functional affiliation, whereby people are organized around a primary affiliation to their common goals, but use their cultural and social differences as strategic resources, not as barriers. So, whereas Penico uh, thinks about these uh, affiliations uh, in terms of uh, gender, class, and sexual orientation as well, uh, G prefers the idea of uh, common interests and desires. Uh, I'm going to, to use this a little bit uh, later because um, uh, the community that I, I am uh, uh, analyzing is uh, students who interact with other people sharing the same interest which is electronic games. Um, so this uh, idea of transcultural flows um, goes against the, the old idea of uh, uh, imperialism, cultural imperialism. And Apia also mentions that in this relationship between global and local, uh, what we have is not uh, we, what has also been uh, fairly discussed lately, uh, a kind of homogeneity in globalization. So he mentions his home country, Ghana, where he said that local people, villagers, they listen to the radio, they like, uh, uh, they talk about the World Cup, Muhammad Ali, Mike Tyson, they listen to hip hop, and they drink coke. But then, he says that the language on the radio is Ghanaian, uh, the soccer team, uh, and the lager are also uh, Ghanaian. So, there isn't. Uh, villagers are connected with lots of places at the same time, but their homogeneity, according to him, is, is too local. Uh, and then the same goes for television. He says that people tend to prefer television programming that's close to their own culture, which is quite similar to what happens in Brazil. Um, so
So he concludes that people in each place make their own uses even of the most famous global commodities, which also uh, resembles Penny Cook's idea of uh, transcultural flows. Since I am talking about education as well, so um, I brought this relationship between cosmopolitanism and education. Uh, for RISB, the glo global shifts that we are witnessing nowadays demand new resources of learning, and learning itself needs to become cosmopolitan, uh, as opposed to some parochial tendencies that he, he finds in traditional schooling. Uh, for thought, instead of directing our educational attention to a notion of a shared community based on the goodness of the subject, we should introduce strangeness for educating beyond narrow nationalisms. Uh, and then uh, that reminds me of also of Diana Bryden's notion of transnational um, literacies uh, in a paper that she delivered in Aracaju two years ago. Uh, and she says that the study of the, the idea would be to study for the under-examined values that the current knowledge power structures of educational systems and language or identity practices carry and the assumptions they perpetuate. Uh, so she states that when those assumptions are examined in their multiple contexts, historical and spatial, they may need to be contested revised or developed to place them more fully in service of the communities involved. So, um, what I, uh, my idea here is then to, to talk about these issues as related to the project, project that I am developing now, and uh, which is named Electronic Games and New Literacies in English Language Teacher Education uh, that has been funded by saint Piquet and is linked to the Pro Projeto Nacional and BRK project as well. So I have as informants English Portuguese literacy students at, the, at my university uh, we, we, who are pre-service English teachers. Uh, so far we have um, applied some questionnaires to these students and they also take part on an online community uh, we started with a community on scholar.com and then we moved to STEAM, which is um, an international, transnational uh, community for gamers. So we are doing this now just to get closer to them because uh, sometimes it's quite difficult to convince these students to come to a specific portal just to take part in uh, research. Uh, so, uh, we had some, I'm not going to talk about the questionnaire. I, I've, I've, what I've brought is uh, uh, some comments from the, this online community, the star.com, where I posted two updates. Uh, which are related to this uh, subject that I'm, I'm discussing here. So the first one was, do you access websites related to electronic games such as forums, fanzines, and fan fiction sites? Which ones specifically, how often, what for? Uh, so we had some um, students um, talking about these sites. Uh, most of all, or maybe all of them, I don't know. Uh, and they seem to be very familiar, very um, uh, at ease talking about these uh, websites uh, that they, they use. Um, this one as well, Rock and Roll Racing, Mega Man X, so mentioning also uh, games. And then I asked them, are these forums and sites in English or Portuguese or, what, or other language? What about their participants? Where are they from? To what extent is this interaction possible without good knowledge of English? So we had some interesting uh, uh, responses here. One of them said, what I have observed in my students is that they do the discussion about games in Portuguese and even after they have learned the translation of the words, they keep using the English equivalents. So she's talking about her uh, probably primary, primary and secondary school uh, students because she is a literacy student herself. Uh, then we have this one, 
uh, saying that some of his friends come come to him when since they don't know how to speak English, so they come to him uh, for help when they need to post something in English uh, online. Uh, the, the other one says that um, these gamers, they use a uh, kind of proper, uh, proper or specific uh, language that comes from the games themselves and the genres that they play. And for him, then, this uh, makes the interaction easier. Even if they don't know English very well, they have a common vocabulary and they know the genre, the genres that they are using, so that makes it easier for them. Uh, so I will uh, conclude here with a um, quote from Jenkins as well. Uh, Classroom discussion can focus attention on the different investments students make in these important cultural materials, depending on their own personal backgrounds and intellectual interests. The goal should be not to push aside taste for popular culture in favor, in favor of preference for a more authentic folk culture or a more refined high culture, but rather to help students build upon what they have already learned about the cultural difference through their engagement with media imports. So my idea is then to go uh, to use this uh, research to see how these ideas can be brought to the classroom with these uh, pre-service teachers and then maybe how they could also use them when they are teaching themselves in uh, primary and uh, secondary education mainly. That's it, thank you.